Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India What we have discussed till now, if we look at uh, briefly, that we started with the ontological questions concerning the ways in which technology, science and society have been conceived of the way the two important forces of production namely science and technology have been conceptualized, the relationship between technology and science and th there we have already discussed how technology is uh, prior to modern science, I mean technology always predates modern science <coughs> okay. and then we have discussed the relationship between technology and science on the one hand and society on the other. And we have used three models of uh, STS, three perspectives on STS, the linear or hierarchical model, the interactionist model and the embedded model. On the one hand, the linear model and the interactionist model treat science, technology and society as distinct entities, treat science, technology and society as separate entities, whereas the embedded model suggests that no science and technology are not autonomous activities, are not isolated phenomena, are not independent activities, rather both science and technology are very much a part of our social formation they are very much a part of our economy, culture and polity. This is very important and from there on staying, I mean staying with uh, the ontological questions, what we have discussed, how uh, the, the idea of technological determinism evolved and how and in what way we see uh, some arguments against technological determinism and how technology is not neutral. Anyway, we will discuss this uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the following lectures uh, sometime later uh, in the week, but what we found that, that the, the neutrality of technology is contingent upon the way a specific technology is designed and controlled and whether a technology is neutral or not, we provided certain examples from the construction of the New York bridge, from the design of the public roads in India that technology is not neutral. Okay? Whenever we talk about technology, we must talk about technology vis-a-vis -vis the nature of the state and the kind of public policies that the state is going to have. Okay? This is very important. In this kind of circumstance, from these, these ontological questions, we moved to the, the normative questions, because the reality suggests that these changes, these uh, uh, changes in the relationship between science, technology and society okay, have significant implications on agriculture, on health, on environment, on social security measures and so on. And in this context, we, we thought, okay, now from these ontological, what, from, from the questions concerning reality, okay, what it ought to be, 
what kind of uh, STS we want to, I, I mean what should be the form of STS, what should be the, the, the uh, what ought to be the practices of STS and from there onward we started uh, a detailed discussion on uh, Mertonian uh, institutional imperatives in the form of Mertonian uh, ethos of science, ethos of modern science. I mean ethos of modern science when I say effectively toned complex of values and norms which is held to be binding on the man of science and these norms are expressed in terms of prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences and permissions. We have already discussed this. Merton also uh, dwelt upon the goal of science as the extension of certified knowledge and the imperatives of science which are derived from the goal and uh, the methods he and, and then he moved to uh, uh, flag four institutional imperatives, four ethos of modern science in the form of universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. If you look at this, then what we find that universalism, communism and disinterestedness, they come under the rubric of the goal of science. Whereas, organized skepticism comes under the, the methodological rational of science. And from this, if, if the reality suggests something, and the normative questions, the normative structure of science suggests something, then what should be the of science that we have tried to delineate okay. within methods of science, we have discussed inductivism, hypothesism, okay, or Karl, uh, I mean positivism, then the methodology provided by Karl Popper. In the lectures to follow, what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss uh, the methodology propounded by Thomas Kuhn uh, and Paul Feyerabend. It does not imply that the methods of science, I mean the debate uh, concerning the methods of science ends here. The debate does not end here, the debate is still on. Okay? And the question, the method, what is the method of science? is as old as science itself. Okay? The question which was addressed, I mean the question what is the method of science was addressed by Aristotle, Aristotle tried to provide a satisfactory answer to this question okay? and, and on the and uh, I mean uh, if you look at the history of science, I mean for 3 centuries from 17th to 20th centuries. Okay. Two methodologies became standout performers to the question which was posed, I mean to the question what is the method of science. And then those two rival methodologies, those two rival responses to this question what is the method of science consist of inductivism and hypothesis. And as we have dis already discussed how inductivism is rooted in empiricism, empiricism is rooted in experience, uh, whatever we cannot observe, okay, cannot be considered knowledge in, in the inductivist schema, okay. knowledge is generated only through observations, okay, mm. which Bacon propounded, okay, Francis Bacon, the father of empiricism, inductivism. On the other hand, what we saw during these three centuries, I mean hypothesis, which was propounded by René Descartes, Descartes is also known as the father of rationalism, hypothesis is grounded in the principles of rationalism, in the philosophy of rationalism. Rationalism is based on reason, according to which knowledge is generated only when we go beyond observation. Whereas, inductivists argued that 
knowledge starts with I mean science starts with observation begins with observation remains at the level of observations and ends with observation. Hypothesists argued that no science starts only when we go beyond observations that is why that is how science is trans observational in nature. Okay. Whereas, inductivists looked upon certainty and breadth as the uh, as the hallmarks of scientific knowledge, hypothesists looked upon novelty and depth as the hallmarks of scientific knowledge. Okay. We have already discussed this, I am just trying to recapitulate whatever has been discussed. Then the question emerged that, uh, that how to mediate the two inductivism and hypothesis. And the 20th century saw the emergence of positivism as the most or one of the most dominant schools of philosophy of science. If you look at the annals of history of science, then you will find the way they tried to develop their perspectives on uh, on the development of society, okay. namely the theological stage, the metaphysical stage, the positivistic or scientific stage. And positivism stood squarely against the schools of theology as well as metaphysics. As we have already discussed, theological stage uh, was more concerned with uh, the changes which occurred due to supernatural forces, whereas metaphysical stage uh, attributes uh, or metaphysical stage attributed uh, changes mediated by natural forces and positivists suggested that no or po positivists or the proponents of positivism or scientific stage suggest that no changes occur not because of supernatural forces or only natural forces, but because of the human action. That is why uh, positivism emerged in the context of uh, the uh, in the con in the context of the, the, the emergence of enlightenment, industrial revolution, okay, critical thinking, rationality, I mean rationalist philosophy of science, modernity and so on. If you if you look at this, positivism also tried to question the dominance of church, okay, which both theological stage and metaphysical stage could not do. I mean they were they were they, they believed in uh, the dominance of religion, uh, uh, especially the dominance of church in uh, Europe. Uh, and Positivism was the first stage in the annals of the methods of science which tried to question the dominance of religion. Okay. That is why positivism provided several tenets, and positivism perhaps was the first organized method of science which tried to look at science. Uh, uh, as a, as a paradigm of knowledge okay, uh, separated from or distinct from other areas of human activity or creativity. Okay. That is why the first tenet if you slightly recall the first tenet suggests that the, the method of science is I mean I mean that uh, that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity because it possesses a method unit to it. Okay. We have discussed many tenets that, uh, th that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter that is methodological monism, that the method of science is the method of induction that is method inductivism, that, um, the, uh, that, uh, uh, that the hallmark of uh, uh, scientific knowledge consists uh, in the fact that uh, all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable that is systematically uh, that is systematic verifiability that there must be a dichotomy between fact and value uh, facts do not have value uh, facts are value neutral 
whereas values do not have factual content uh, there must be a unilateral relationship between observation and theory then we came to a critique of positivism that no observation is presuppositionless no observation is theory independent as positivists argued observations are always theory laden because the way we discussed i mean uh, uh, observation doesn't provide us with a language or idiom for expression whereas theory provides us with a uh, uh, with a um, uh, language or idiom for expression okay in the context of observation whether observations presuppose theory or not we discuss then if if no observation is presuppositionless if science doesn't start with observation as inductivists as well as positivists argued such systematic rejection or systematic critique of positivistic construal of science was brought about by karl popper and there we have already discussed how popper started with posing this question what is the central question of philosophy that is the problem of cosmology what is the problem of cosmology now the problem of understanding the world including ourselves as part of the world if we get our uh, if we get isolated from the world then we are not we cannot examine the world we cannot understand the world to understand the world we must be a part of the world we must involve ourselves with the real world phenomena then popper argued uh, i mean popper uh, immediately tried to delineate the method of science by uh, making a reference to the context of justification and he refused to talk anything about uh, uh, the context of discovery because for him for for popper context of uh, i mean it is impossible it is not possible to provide a rational account of context of discovery okay uh, and Uh, he always sided with the context of justification while providing an explanation for popper science must science cannot start with uh, observation as uh, inductivists or positivists argued or science also cannot start with a hypothesis as hypotheticists argued for popper science must start with a problem if there is no problem then what kind of observation that you are going to make because whatever observations that we make it the uh, our observations must involve some element of selection some amount of selection and that selection is very important uh, uh, why why do we make uh, uh, how is science, uh, knowledge generated in the domain of science uh, for popper precisely because um, uh, if if my observation and my expectation coincide then we are not going to generate science if our observation and expectation they do not coincide if our observ uh, if my uh, expectation deviates from the kind of observation that i i am making okay then there is a scope of knowledge production in this context popper is uh, popper, popper's view is extremely important to note that uh, that science must start with a problem with a research question science must be able to identify a problem from that problem we must try to formulate a hypothesis which is a tentative solution uh, to a problem or hunch from the formulation of hypothesis the way hypothesists argued that it must be tested right or wrong and if uh, uh, a hypothesis is tested wrong then it must be rejected if a hypothesis is tested right then it must be accepted but for popper this this hypothesis may not be tested right or wrong but a hypothesis must be falsified to i am just giving you one more cue that uh, as we have already discussed that you see a hypothesis need not be proved or disproved uh, if one is die hard in proving or uh, disproving his or her hypothesis then it hinders 
the tradition of cumulative knowledge production. One must remember this, then a hypothesis must be tested right or wrong in the hypothesis schema. For, for Popper, it must be falsified, it must go through the process of systematic falsification. If it must go through, if the hypothesis must go through the process of systematic falsification, then it may run the danger of, uh, I mean, uh, I mean it may be again uh, falsified, I mean it may be tested again right or wrong, but if it is tested wrong, then it, it runs the danger of refutation. Okay? it must be subject to refutation. We must refute that, we must reject that hypothesis. On the other hand, if our hypothesis is tested right, hypothesis would have argued that let us accept our hypothesis. For Popper, no, let us not accept our hypothesis, rather let us corroborate our hypothesis. Let us keep our hypothesis permanently tentative. By doing that, Popper meant that under certain limiting conditions, we are trying to corroborate or, or we are trying to keep our hypothesis permanently tentative, because we have not yet been able to explore all, I mean we have not yet been able to explore all conditions as well as we have not yet been able to test our hypothesis under all other conditions. Okay? That is why there is the, the question of universality okay, was, uh, was interrogated by, by Popper. That is why the question of truth was interrogated by uh, absolute truth. That is why he used the term very similitude, I mean very close to the truth or uh, truth likeness or truth nearness. Okay. That is why what is that very similitude? No, that uh, um, the, the, the distinction between an existing theory and a better theory. And for Popper, a better theory has the, the, uh, the, has the characteristics of, has the tenets of very similitude. I mean it is uh, closer to the truth, but it is not the truth in itself. Okay? And such, such characterization, such delineation of uh, uh, Popperian methodology okay, was also questioned by uh, many, many, many uh, authors. In fact, Popper had uh, as many uh, critics, as many number of critics you will see and uh, you will also find similarly, he had uh, uh, many, many admirers. Okay? If Popper's method of systematic falsification provided us, provided us with a uh, paradigm uh, in the method of science in the second half of the 20th century, then one of his perhaps the greatest rivals which emerged, who emerged uh, uh, in the form of the structure of scientific revolutions namely Thomas Samuel Kuhn. And these two, both Popper and Kuhn, they uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, if you look at the works of Steve Fuller, if you look at uh, the school, the, the, uh, the Edinburgh school, I mean uh, Latour, Bourdieu and so on, okay, you will find that, that the controversies I mean the, the debates aroused in the context of the methods of science by both Popper and Kuhn is interesting, I mean the are interesting to learn. Precisely because they provided two different methods which cannot be refuted on, on their own, at least today, at least today. Both of them are uh, no more. But, but we still celebrate their works as quite novel works, uh, perhaps uh, quite original works in their own right. Okay? 
having dwelt upon Popperian uh, methodology and the kind of critical remarks that we made in the uh, through the works of N. R. Hansen in the last lecture, let us briefly look at the views of Thomas Samuel Kuhn. If you look at this, okay, Kuhn, I mean his uh, magnum opus work. I mean the structure of scientific revolution. Uh, in 1962, okay, constitutes a turning point in the 20th century philosophy. Before we comment on the radical ramifications of Kuhn's views, a brief exposition of his fundamental ideas must be put in place. It is important to know under what circumstances Kuhn was writing, what kind of uh, uh, transition that science always makes or has already uh, has uh, uh, has already made okay must be understood critically okay and kuhn provides with that kind of paradigm for kuhn according to kuhn okay the life of every major science passes through two stages two successive stages which may be characterized as pre paradigmatic stage as well as paradigmatic. During the pre paradigmatic period of a science, one finds more than one mo more than one mode of practicing that particular science. Thus, there was a time when there were different schools in astronomy which practiced astronomy differently. So, was the case with disciplines like physics, chemistry and biology too. Their situation at that stage of their development was similar to the one which obtains today in the case of creative areas like art, literature, philosophy, uh, 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 history, mm. even sociology uh, and even medicine, okay, wherein different divergent modes of practicing these disciplines coexist. Why is it so? Earlier, there was there were various schools of astronomy, there were various schools of physics, there were various schools of chemistry, there were various schools of biology. But today, if you look at this, they are trying to build a consensus within these disciplines okay, for, for Kuhn, okay, which creative areas like art, literature, philosophy and even medicine, okay, they are not able to create that kind of consensus uh, uh, precisely because of the kind of uh, because, because of the nature of the problems that we are endowed with. Then because that is that is why uh, what we find today that perhaps perhaps in astrono in the context of astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology okay, you find some kind of a thinking or some kind of a con convergent thinking. Whereas, in the creative areas like uh, art, literature, philosophy and even medicine. What we generally find the, the there is there are divergent modes of practicing these disciplines. I mean in medicine you find allopathy, you find Ayurvedic, you Ayurveda, you may find uh, uh, homeopathy, you may find Yunani, you may find naturopathy. Okay? There is no one there is no consensus. But in the case of astronomy, there is a consensus. I mean, there, today there is a consensus. Suppose, I will say that uh, earlier notion as we have already discussed in the context of Ptolemy prior to Copernicus, okay, you will find that uh, no, uh, uh, the, the, the sun rotates okay, and the earth remains constant that is Ptolemic version of astronomy. Ptolemy was also influenced by the powers that be at that time. Whereas, Copernicus and subsequently Galileo, they tried to convince, they tried to foreground the fact that no, the sun remains constant, okay? rather the earth rotates, moves around the sun. In this context, we have we have come to a point of a 
convergent thinking in the field of astronomy. But in the field of medicine today, we do not have convergent thinking, rather we have divergent thinking. In the context of literature, in the context of art, in the context of music, in the context of philosophy, in the context of history, we have divergent modes of practicing. Okay? That is why, whereas even today we speak of schools of art, schools of literature, schools of philosophy and systems or schools of medicine. We do not speak of schools of astronomy, schools of physics, schools of biology etcetera. This is because according to Kuhn, areas like art, literature, philosophy and medicine did not and perhaps cannot come to a point of convergent thinking, cannot make a transition from pre paradigmatic stage to a paradigmatic stage. Then if I say pre parad if, if I if I go ahead with Kuhnian version of uh, 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 paradigmatic shifts, then I must make a reference to the fact that in the pre paradigmatic stage we found convergent thinking sorry divergent thinking whereas in the paradigmatic stage we find convergent thinking okay that's why according to kuhn creative areas like art music literature philosophy and medicine did not and perhaps cannot make a transition from pre paradigmatic stage to paradigmatic stage so, what characterizes a science which enters the paradigmatic stage is the disappearance of schools. Uh, those divergent modes of thinking must disappear okay, in the context of a paradigm. Okay. That is why they try to build a consensus. Okay. Uh, what is a consensus? We will come to this a little while later. If what characterizes a science which enters the paradigmatic stage is the disappearance of schools. Okay. In other words, the transition from the pre paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage implies the replacement of plurality by uniformity of practice. Now, in astronomy, uh, now no astronomer would tell you okay, um, that uh, no, uh, the earth remains constant and the sun rotates, the sun moves around the, the earth. Okay. Now, they, they have come to a point of convergent thinking uh, that uh, no, they, they, their opinion is uniform now, uniformly based okay, in the Kunian schema uh, that, uh, that the, the transition from pre paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage implies the replacement of plurality by uniformity of practice, uh, 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 the transition from the pre paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage implies the replacement of the replacement of divergent thinking uh, okay, by the convergent thinking. Okay. That is why replacement of plurality by uniformity of practice. Okay. Whereas, or, or when, when a science reaches the paradigmatic stage, it becomes according to Kuhn mature or science in the present sense of the term. It becomes mature okay? and, and if I say that uh, a science would make a transition from pre paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage or the who, who which discipline was the first to to make a transition from pre paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage. Now, astronomy was the first to enter the paradigmatic stage followed by physics, then chemistry and then biology. Social sciences, I mean including sociology uh, which I hail from okay, as, a, as a student of sociology, okay, uh, uh, I would always uh, say even, even, even Kuhn also suggested that uh, social sciences are very much in the pre paradigmatic stage since they have not yet succeeded in bringing about consensus over their practice as is shown by the prevalence of schools in social sciences. 
creative areas like art, literature, music, philosophy uh, uh, and so on perhaps can never reach the second stage precisely because of the nature of the problems that we are confronted with today in social sciences, in humanity. Okay? Perhaps, uh, but, but, but that is a different question whether we should have a consensus or not, is it an ethical question or not that is a different story altogether okay? uh, in today's context. Okay? Perhaps, perhaps divergent thinking uh, in social sciences is preferred, okay? but, but that is not, 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 not there in the Kunin schema as such, okay? we will we'll come to this point. Then what kind of mature science that we talk about? A science thus becomes mature when it acquires a paradigm. I mean science becomes mature when it makes a transition from pre-paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage. It is the acquisition of a paradigm which replaces plurality by uniformity of practice. It is the acquisition of a paradigm which replaces divergent thinking by convergent thinking. Then what are these paradigms all about? What do we know or what do we mean by paradigms? Okay? We all suppose if you look at different uh, uh, disciplines, suppose we have discussed that uh, no uh, for in the Kunian schema that uh, we have made a, uh, we, we have made a statement that uh, uh, astronomy was the first to uh, make a transition from pre-paradigmatic stage to a paradigmatic stage uh, followed by physics, then chemistry and then biology, then what kind of paradigm that they have created? If you look at this, we all know that Ptolemy's Almagest was a paradigm in astronomy. Later on, we say Copernican revolution is a paradigm in astronomy. Okay? when Ptolemy was rejected. Newton's Principia was a paradigm in physics. Now we say, no, Einstein's theory of relativity is the paradigm in physics. But today, perhaps, perhaps still now we have not yet been able to come up with any alternative, but Darwin in the field of biological sciences still rules the roost, Darwin's the origin of species. Then we all know that Ptolemy's Almagest, initially Newton's Principia, and Darwin's The Origin of Species are path breaking works in the areas of astronomy, physics and biology respectively. According to Kuhn, these works provided paradigms for these disciplines and they did so by specifying the exact manner in which these disciplines ought to proceed. They laid the ground rules, okay? laid the foundations regarding what problems these disciplines must tackle and how to tackle them. Then a paradigm, a paradigmatic discipline, a paradigmatic work must not only tries to, attempts to uh, identify problems for their respective disciplines, but also must be able to show how to address those problems, how to answer those problems, okay? how to tackle them. Hence, then what are paradigms theoretically? Then for, for Kuhn, let me quote Kuhn here, paradigms are universally recognized scientific achievements that for a time provide model problems and solutions to those model problems to a community of practitioners. It not only provides model problems but also provide solutions to those model solutions to those model problems to a community of practitioners in the case of in, in this case to a community of scientists. Okay? Let, me, let me break this statement of Kuhn, definition of Kuhn, the way he dealing it. Okay? First, a paradigm specifies what the ultimate constituents of that sphere of reality which a particular science is inquiring into are. Secondly, it identifies the model problems, model questions. Thirdly, it specifies the possible range of solutions to those 
model questions or model problems. Fourthly, it provides the necessary strategies and techniques to solve those problems, I mean methodologies. Okay. Finally, it provides examples uh, which show how to solve those, those certain problems. In other words, a paradigm is a disciplinary matrix of a professional group. Then we must start, we must start with start, I mean we must discuss one by one. Number one, a paradigm specifies what the ultimate constituents of that science of reality which a particular science is inquiring into or I mean the entire subject matter of that science must be known. The scope and ambit of that particular science must be known through that paradigm. And for a long time Ptolemy's Almagast in fact provided with, with uh, us with that. Copernicus later on provided with, us with that. Then Newton also, I mean Einstein, Darwin, Okay. Then that particular paradigm perhaps suppose Darwin's uh, the origin of species, evolution of species, principle of natural selection. Okay. They, that paradigm tries to uh, identify the model problems. What are the uh, model problems? Suppose if I say, uh, let me give you an example that uh, if I say dinosaur, anaconda, they were far more powerful compared to human species like us. So, if you look at their energy, if you look at their stamina, way they have that they possess that killer instinct. Okay. I mean they, can, they could have uh, survived, why they could not survive and human beings, human species survived. Okay. Darwin provided a satisfactory answer, later on Marx provided a satisfactory answer and other biologists uh, uh, they also uh, have provided uh, satisfactory answer to such question. Number one is adaptability, a, uh, a species howsoever uh, may be huge or small okay, that species must be able to adapt to the existing environment nature number one. and number two is that power to reproduce further I mean you have to further your generations. Okay. In those two cases okay, Darwin that Darwin uh, principle of natural selection if you look at this I mean this, this is how we have survived okay. human species have survived. Okay. These are the model problems that that uh, uh, Darwin provided, principle, and also the kind of model solutions to those model problems. Okay, within that specific discipline of biology, he also provided principle of natural selection. Okay, fourthly, a paradigm must provide the necessary strategies and techniques for solving those problems. I must, I mean, the the particular paradigm must be able to provide the necessary methods, methodological framework must provide, must formulate a proper method or model methodological framework to solve those model problems. And finally, a paradigm must provide examples which show how to solve the certain problems. That is why perhaps uh, Kuhn mentioned that a paradigm is a disciplinary matrix of a professional group. In this context professional group I mean the scientific community. Okay. I mean there is no individual scientist here, but, but the collective scientific community on the whole. Once a science matures, once a science comes to possess a paradigm, it develops what Kuhn calls normal science studies. This is a normal science, normal science does not mean normal or abnormal science, I mean norm bound science, which are bound by rules, regulations, values, institutional mandates, normative framework of science. Okay. Then what is that normal science? Normal science is the day to day research activity purporting to force nature into conceptual boxes provided by a particular paradigm. 
and the practitioners of normal science that is scientists themselves who are engaged in day to day research internalize the paradigm by professional education and such 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 professional i mean this 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 internalization of the paradigm by professional education explains the prevalence of textbook culture to science education okay that is norm bound science value based science you cannot deviate from the rules and regulations of science okay that is normal science you cannot deviate from the norms you cannot go beyond the norms you have to operate your practices you have to uh, you have to carry out your experiments within certain norms within certain rules regulations frameworks institutions structures organizations mandates and so okay and and from here onward what we we see okay what kind of normal science then we are talking indeed scientific practices are not exhausted in terms of day to day research or normal science when a paradigm fails to promote fruitful interesting and smooth normal science it is considered to be in a crisis and the deepening of the crisis leads to the replacement of the existing paradigm by a new paradigm that's why paradigms are also not static the existing paradigm may become a a, a pre paradigmatic stage for a new paradigm okay they are not static they are quite quite dynamic i mean paradigm means model models are not static models change with the changes in uh, the questions the problems the uh, the circumstances conditions uh, and so on okay that's why when a paradigm fails to promote fruitful interesting and smooth normal science tradition it is considered to be in a crisis the deepening of the crisis leads to the replacement of the existing paradigm by a new paradigm and this process of replacement of the existing paradigm by the new paradigm is called scientific revolution i mean you may say uh, revolutionary science as against normal science normal science is norm bound institution bound rule bound regulation bound but but in the context of revolutionary science it goes beyond norms had there been no revolutionary science there would not have been copernicus had there been no revolutionary science there would not have been any einstein there had there been no revolutionary science then there would not have been any darwin otherwise everybody used to uh, now everybody thinks uh, i mean uh, prior to darwin there was uh, thinking that uh, uh, i mean prior to marx also people people used to think that you know um, uh, how have we uh, there was a theological explanation that gods and goddesses have created us such questions were raised i mean such questions were challenged such uh, such propositions were challenged okay by darwin initially and then subsequently marx and so on. okay uh, that's why marx once wrote darwin has made god redundant okay in the context of the origin of species and the context of the principle of natural selection okay that's why this process of replacement of the of the existing paradigm by a new paradigm okay is also called scientific revolution or revolutionary science you can say therefore scientific revolutions if 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 i say uh, if if normal science is which is a puzzle solving activity which is a day to day which re, which refers to a day to day research activity okay if normal science is the tradition bound activity then revolutionary science is the tradition shattering activity therefore scientific revolution are the tra tradition shattering complements to the tradition bound activity of normal science thus once a science enters the paradigmatic stage it is characterized by first normal science and second revolutionary science i repeat if 
I mean normal science, the way it is known as a puzzle solving activity, the know we know, the way we know that uh, normal science is a, a, a day to day research activity, norm bound activity, if normal science is uh, refers to a tradition bound activity, then revolutionary science is the tradition shattering activity. It, it does not follow tradition, it, it goes beyond the hitherto existing traditional norms, uh, institutional frameworks, uh, structures, organizational mandates and so on. Okay? That is how science makes progress. In sheer temporal terms, normal science occupies much larger span than does revolutionary science. That is to say, science is revolutionary once a while and mostly it is non-revolutionary or normal that we find. Okay. Also, the scientific activity engaged by most of the practitioners can be characterized aptly in terms of the I mean uh, in terms of normal science. Because of this temporal and numerical magnitude, we can say that much of the scientific activity as we ordinarily encounter is normal, though this normal uh, uh, course is occasionally interrup interrup interrupted by revolutions which change the form, content and direction of the process of the scientific community activity which is basically normal by which we mean a uh, non-revolutionary committed and tradition bound activity. That is why normal science is always tradition bound activity whereas revolutionary science is uh, always tradition shattering activity. Thank you.